Hey what's up guys, and welcome back to the second installment video in the Dark Souls 3 PvP Basics series. And in this video I'm going to be going over all of the basic controls of Dark Souls 3. Now at some points in this video it may seem like the things that I'm talking about are extremely basic even for beginners, but it's really important that everybody has a full understanding of even the most basic controls and concepts of the game at its core. And this video is going to kind of act as a preparation video for the next one that I'm going to be releasing, which is going to dive into one of the key skills of PvP. And so it's important that you guys are just ready for that and totally up to speed with a full mastery of the absolute basic controls. So without any further ado, let's get right into the video. Alright, so to start things off here, I just want to go over your in-game settings just to make sure you're using the best ones possible and you're not putting yourself at any unnecessary disadvantages. So starting off on the first settings page here, you can see I have toggle auto lock on turned off, auto target turned off, and then manual attack aiming turned on. And what this manual attack aiming will do is when you're locked on to another player, it will allow you to still continue to aim your attack where you want it to go. So you could aim it a little bit to the side or away from them, even while you're locked on. And this one's a little bit of personal preference. I've seen some people that like to play with it on and others like to play with it off, but that's something you'll just have to test out and see what you like best. But I find that manual attack aiming allows me to sometimes aim the uh, whatever weapon I'm using just a little bit in front of them and help out with the lock-on tracking But other people find that it sometimes messes them up when they just wanted it to lock on and hit the player But I find it kind of helps to improve the tracking of some weapons So you'll have to do a little bit of experimenting with this setting uh, But I like to keep it on now moving on to the second settings page here You can see I just have most of these on the normal default. I have the camera speed set to 10 but I've turned off camera auto wall recovery. And so this one is generally gonna push your camera in directions that you may not necessarily want it in. And so I prefer to keep this setting off. And then cinematic effects, what this does is basically turns on screen shake when you get a critical attack. So whether that be a backstab or a riposte after a parry, your screen will kind of shake a little bit as you do the animation of stabbing them or hitting the ground or whatever it is. And so I like to just keep that on, but some people find the screen shake to be a little bit annoying if they're getting a lot of uh, critical attacks, but I like to keep it on. I think it looks pretty cool. So that one's just another preference one, but the camera auto wall recovery, I would recommend turning that off. Then over here on the next page, we have the blood setting, and I like to keep that off. If you turn it to mild, it'll change the blood color to, I believe, like a brownish black color, which is kind of weird. And then on is just regular blood setting on, really red blood. But I like to just play with it off. I find it a little bit distracting. Some people think it looks cool, but this is just another personal preference one, pretty much. And subtitles turned on. HUD for new players, you're going to want to play with that on. There's only specific reasons that you want to play with HUD off, like I mean, if you're a montage player or you want to make videos, you might recommend, uh, I might recommend for you to turn that off, but you'll know the situation when you want to turn that off. And I would not recommend using the auto HUD setting as I find it just, it's not that great. Next up, we have the brightness page, and this is another one that's just pretty much personal preference, although I would recommend that you play with your brightness slightly higher than it recommends. So for example, for me, I can still see the dragon even though it says you want to make sure it's invisible, and that's just because I find I like the game to be a little bit brighter, helps me to see players easier, and just there's some really dark areas in the game that I find it may not look as good to have it brighter, but I just find it helps me see things easier, and so if you're in it for a little bit more competitive aspect to the game, then you're probably going to want to make sure you can see as much as possible, rather than making sure the game looks kind of the way it was intended to and having the dark spots really dark. But I like to keep it a bit brighter, like I said, so I can see things as best as possible. Then on this page here, we have a cross-region play setting. And what I believe this does is cross-region matchmaking. When you enable that, all that does is apparently there's just two matchmaking sections, I believe. And one is for Japan and one is for the rest of the world. And so if you turn on cross-region matchmaking and you're outside of Japan or in Japan, that'll just allow you to play with everybody that's on Dark Souls 3. And then if you turn that off and let's say you live in North America, for example, 
you switch that to off, you just will no longer be matched with anybody from Japan. And so it's not really a uh, super extensive matchmaking setting, but I just prefer to keep it on, keep my player base as wide as possible. I don't mind playing with people from Japan, even if we would have a lot of latency, but that's what that setting does. Uh, next up is password matchmaking. This password is for if you want to play with a friend. If you put a password in, both of you enter the same password, then it'll allow you to see each other's summon signs and nobody else. So you can give each uh, person a password and then you both lay down your summon signs and have a third friend pick both of you up and that way you're not getting confused with anybody else or nobody else is summoning you. Uh, but that's what that does. Then summon sign visibility, uh, unrestricted, will just allow everybody to see your summon sign. Then voice chat, I have set to restricted. This is just uh, whether or not you want to have voice chat with phantoms or not. There isn't actually a full-blown voice chat mode. It's only when, uh, the only possible way you could use voice chat is with summoned phantoms and you could talk to them, but I don't use that. Launch setting, just play online. And moving on to the next tab, we just have a mouse sensitivity page, and then of course where you'll find all your key bindings and you can make adjustments there. For people that are using a controller, I would recommend you just stick with all the standard ones. They're pretty good, there isn't really any reason that I find that I would need to change them. But for keyboard and mouse players, then you would probably want to make some changes there, as the default bindings aren't the greatest I've found, although I do not play keyboard and mouse, so I'm not uh, a professional when it comes to those binds. But it's up to you, and most key bindings are personal preference, just like it is with uh, a few of these other settings. Moving on, you have your screen mode. I would recommend you set that to full screen. Then for resolution, I would recommend you set that to whatever the maximum resolution of your monitor is, as long as your computer can handle it. And then auto detect best rendering settings, I would turn that off and come into advanced settings. And in here, most of these are just going to be you're going to want to set them to whatever your computer can handle while maintaining a solid 60 fps if at all possible but the one setting i would highly recommend you turn off is motion blur that's going to just add blur when you're turning the camera around and panning it really fast and you don't want that that's just going to obstruct your view so that's the one main setting i would recommend you turn off and finally if we come back here our last settings tab is just to save and quit the game so to quickly recap here, the settings that I would recommend everybody changes is setting toggle auto lock on to off, auto target to off, then camera auto wall recovery to off, and finally making sure to turn off your motion blur under the advanced settings. The next thing that I'd like to go over is what every single button input does. So every single type of attack and button that you use to navigate the game. Now, for the remainder of this video, as I'm explaining things, I'm going to continue to have my controller layout in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, so you can always see exactly which buttons I'm pressing and when. And for anybody who's using keyboard and mouse, if you're ever unsure of what a certain button does on the controller and what its equivalent is on keyboard and mouse, just keep in mind that you can always go into your settings and then go to the key bindings to see exactly what you have it assigned to. To start things off here, we have probably the most used button in the game, which is R1, the standard light attack for whichever weapon is in your right hand. Now of course this is explained in the very first starting area, if you read these messages, it says RB or R1 is your regular attack, and you probably figured this out from playing the game, or of course read it on this message, but something that I want you to keep in mind is that any animation pretty much that you see that is different from the last one, or any animation that is different from one another, even if you're pressing the same button over again, it is at least different in some way. So if I press R1, and then press R1 again like that, you can see it was the same animation, so that's the same exact attack. But if I press R1 and then press R1 again almost immediately after, you can see I swing again, but this time from left to right instead of from right to left. Now that is a different attack, and I know it might not be clear at this time, but in future videos I just want you to keep that in mind as I'm going to go into things about hit stun and all sorts of other things. It's just important to know that obviously your second R1 is different from your first one because it has a different animation. So in almost all cases, if there's a different animation for an attack, it means it's different in at least some way, whether that be speed or hit stun, but like I said, I'll get the, into that in a future video. 
Using the same weapon, you can see that our R1 attack animation changes once again if I simply press Y and choose to two-hand the weapon. You can see we get a completely different attack animation once again. Next up, we have the right trigger strong attack, or I like to call it the heavy attack or charged heavy attack because you can charge it. Now you can see if I press R2 or RT, there's your heavy attack, and you can see it's slightly slower than a regular R1 attack, but it can be charged, so if I hold on to the right trigger, and then release it, you have a much longer charged attack. Now you can charge it for however long you'd like, you can let go halfway through, and release, and of course you'll perform the attack, or you can continue to hold on to it, but eventually you will be forced to let go and it will activate the attack, and you can only charge it for a predetermined amount of time. So you can see if I continue to hold right trigger, even though I'm not letting go, it will eventually perform the attack anyways. And similar to the R1, if I follow up the first R2 with a second one, or the first RT with a second one, you have a different attack animation. So once again, a different attack animation, pressing R2 immediately after the first one. Moving on to the third button now, we have clicking in the right stick, which is target lock slash release, or your lock on slash unlock button. And this is another one of the most commonly used buttons. So you see right here, if you have an enemy, whether that be another player, or of course PVE, if you click on the right stick, you lock on and you get a little circle showing that you're locked onto that target and your player will now kind of move as uh, focused on that target. And if, like I said, this is another really important one and it's used pretty frequently. This next button here actually has two different functions and which animation you do is actually dependent on what you're doing with your left stick. So if I were to just press the B button while not touching my left stick at all, I'll perform a back step. But then if I decide to move around with my left stick and then I tap the B button, I'll perform a roll. Besides the back step and the roll, the B button actually has a third function in combination with the left stick. So if you're moving around with the left stick and you hold down the B button, you'll actually start sprinting. So you can see I hold down the B button while moving my left stick and now I start sprinting. And I can even tap B quickly, let go of B and then tap it again to perform a roll out of my sprint. Once again, this is all very basic stuff that you probably already know, but I'm going over it for a reason, so please bear with me. Moving on, we have the left bumper, which is guard, but this button can be used for a wide variety of different things, and it's dependent on what items or weapons you're actually holding. So in this instance, you can see I have a shield, and so I will guard with it, but if I two-hand my sword, you can see I press LB again, and I will guard with my sword as well. Now, in other scenarios, when you have dual wielding weapons, the left bumper will often be an attack with both of the weapons at the same time, or both of the weapons in some type of combination. Next up, we have the left trigger, and this is another button that is dependent on which items you're holding in your hands. But in general, this button is referred to as the weapon art button. In this case, I'm holding a shield in my left hand, and this particular shield has the parry weapon art, so if I were to press the left trigger, I'll perform a parry. But if I were to two-hand my sword, and then press the left trigger, the weapon art button again, I'll perform a weapon art stance. Continuing on, we have clicking in the left stick. Now, clicking in the left stick does not do anything, as you can see, when I'm standing still or when I'm just normally walking around. But if I'm sprinting, so holding down B while I'm moving the left stick, and then I click it in, I will perform a jump. And then you can see if I click it in once again and continue holding the stick forward, I'll do a jump and then roll afterwards. Whereas if I just click it in and then let go of everything, I will land like that. So the only function of clicking in the left stick is to perform a jump. The next button that we have is the X button. And when you press X, it will use whichever item is currently selected in your sort of hotbar thing. So if I'm hovering over my Estus and I press X, I'll use that. And then Ashen Estus, same thing. And if I had shivs or fire bombs or anything else up in that little menu there, I would just simply move to it, hover over it, and press X to use it. Now X is also used in the menu for menu navigation. So if I enter the menu here, I can press X on certain items to remove them, so that will unequip them. 
You could also just go into the menu and press A to equip and unequip your items, but sometimes pressing X is faster as you don't need to navigate further into the menu system. Which brings us to our next button, which is the A button actually. And the A button allows us to interact with things, so picking items up off the ground and reading messages, as well as inside our menu, that's how we're going to select all of our different items that we want to equip. And so A is generally our select button. It's not used for any in-game animations or activating anything. It's generally just picking things up and interacting. Then we have our Y button, and the Y button allows us to toggle between two-handing and one-handing our weapon. But we can also hold down the Y button for a brief moment, and then we will two-hand our off-hand weapon. So you can see I can two-hand this shield here. Moving on again, we have our D-pad. And the different directions of the D-pad allow you to interact both in the game here, and also inside the menu to navigate it up and down, left and right. Now, if you're just playing the game like this and you're not in the menu, you can also toggle between your weapons. So if I have a second weapon equipped, it doesn't have to be a shield, just in my main hand here, you can see I have the shield, I can press right on the D-pad and my character will switch to the shield, then press it again to switch back to the sword. You can do that with up to three weapons in your right hand, and then three weapons in your left hand as well. So if you see I switch my items to the left hand here, then I can also toggle between them on the left by hitting left on the D-pad. Now this is super helpful and I'll get into certain techniques that really take advantage of this and organizing your menu uh, in specific ways in a later video as well. Now the last button combination that has a distinct animation is the kick. And to perform a kick you move the left stick forward at the same time as hitting R1. So it looks like this. And this is really important that you learn how to kick and that you master doing this move as a lot of people seem to skip out on this one and this is something that a lot of people don't use for whatever reason. And there's a lot of things that are going to come into play later on in more advanced tutorials and that's just one of the reasons why I need you guys to learn this now and make sure you have it mastered as there's a lot of things that come along with the kick and you should be able to master it and be able to do it consistently. It takes a little bit of practice actually and I think that's why a lot of people don't use it or don't even really learn it is because it's a little bit finicky and you just have to get the timing right and figure out how to do it. For whatever reason some people just don't end up learning it. Coming to an end here we have the select button which brings up the gesture menu and finally the start button which opens up the main menu of course and the start button also closes the main menu so you use start to open it and then start again to close it. So please, I do not want to see anybody pressing the B button to escape and back out of the menu. I did this for way too long, it was embarrassing. Just use the start button again, you press it, it instantly closes the menu, and you're good to go. Now that we've gone over the basic controls and you know exactly what each button does, I'd like to go over each different type of attack in the game. Starting out with the first type of attack, we have the standard R1 light attack, and this can be either one-handed or two-handed, and for this weapon in particular, it makes a huge difference whether you're one-handing it or two-handing it when you're doing that type of attack. Then we have the second R1 attack, which once again is different from the standard first R1. Next up, we have the R2, the charged heavy attack. Just like we have one-handed R1 attacks, we also have one-handed R2 attacks. So we can charge these just like before, and that's what a one-handed R2 looks like with this weapon. And you can also just tap it. Moving on, we also have rolling attacks. And rolling attacks are performed by queuing the attack animation while you're in a roll. So if you roll and then press R1 in the middle of your roll, or very, very shortly after you've basically just completed the roll, you'll still be able to activate a rolling attack. So you just click R1, usually in the middle of a roll, or right at the end of a roll, and you'll do a rolling attack, which once again is very different as you can see in the animation from the standard R1. We also have rolling heavy attacks, or rolling charged R2s. So we can roll and press R2, or right trigger, and we do a rolling heavy attack. And we can also charge this just like the standard R2, if we roll and then just tap it, we'll do a quicker heavy attack, or we can roll and then fully charge it up like this, and we'll do a fully charged rolling R2. Then we have the L1 attack with the dual wielded weapons. If you're two ending them and you press L1, you'll attack with both of the weapons. And if you continue that and keep pressing L1, sometimes you'll have three different animations, one after another. 
Next up, we have a running attack, and you perform a running attack by holding down B, of course, while moving the left stick, and then simply clicking R1, and you will do a running attack. You can see that's very different, once again, from the regular R1. This is a running attack. We also have a jumping attack, and this can be performed two ways. The first way is by sprinting and then tapping RT or R2, and you'll perform a jumping attack like that. Or you can also do the same button inputs as a kick, except for instead of using R1, you press R2, and that looks like that, and you can just activate the jumping attack from standing still. The next attack is the kick attack, and just like some weapons have a kick, which is sort of an attack, other weapons actually have an attack that goes along with that motion, so it's not the normal kick. So you can see here with most curved swords like this, if I do a kick, it will do sort of a backflip, and so that is the curved swords kick attack. Similar to the jumping attack, we have the plunge attack, and this one can be activated a few different ways as well. The first way that you can activate it is by simply running off a ledge that's tall enough, and then tapping R1 in the air, and then your character will do a plunge animation with your weapon. The second way that you can activate a plunge attack is by jumping off a ledge, so you can just add a little jump into it, and then tap R1 midair as well. And the last way that you can do a plunge attack is by actually using that jumping attack that I just mentioned. So if you walk up to a ledge like this and activate a jumping attack, then you can do a plunge attack off of it. And what's cool about this is that you can actually do plunge attacks in locations that you wouldn't otherwise normally be able to. So for example, this location here, if I were to run and jump and try to press R1 midair, I'm not actually allowed to do a plunge here because it's not tall enough. But if I do a jumping attack off, I will be able to. The final type of attack is the backstab attack, and this happens when you get the initial backstab grab, but the other player does not give confirmation of the backstab on their end, and therefore you won't fully get sucked into the backstab, and instead your player will just do an attack. Moving right along to when you're using a weapon in your offhand as well as in your main hand, your main hand weapon's moveset will stay the same as if you were just normally one-handing it, so you'll still have your normal one-handed R1 and one-handed R2, but then in your left hand, the other weapon will have usually a block with L1, and then something similar to its R1 using your left trigger, which is normally the weapon R button. So you can see this is what the left trigger looks like with this dagger in the off hand. And then if I put it in my main hand and then use R1, very similar. There are definitely certain trade-offs that come with using a weapon like this in your off hand one-handed. For example, you won't be able to use its charged R2 or heavy attack, because, of course, that will activate the heavy attack, the one-handed heavy attack, that is, of the weapon in your right hand. And you also won't have access to its weapon art either, because, as we learned, when we're dual-wielding them like this, with our dagger in our offhand, the left trigger, or weapon art button, activates the light attack of the dagger. Which brings me to my next point, and that is weapon arts. When it comes to weapon art attacks, I think it's an interesting topic because a lot of weapons have their own unique weapon art attacks and weapon art combos, but you can generally categorize them in a few different ways. For example, most straight swords and great swords have stance weapon arts, so if you press LT or hold it down, you'll do a stance, and then you can press generally R1 or R2 while holding that stance, and you'll do some type of attack. But there are other weapons that you can do different combos with, like for example hitting L2, and then R1, and then R1 again, and you can continue into this sort of whole weapon art combo, or L2, then R1, then R2, and there's all sorts of different things that you can do. And so it's kind of just up to you, you want to just mess around with weapon arts and see what you can do. And then you'll just basically learn from experience, and you'll learn all the different weapon art combos for different weapons, figure out which ones that you like, and you'll kind of figure out their use cases as well. But there's a lot of different type of types of attacks, I guess, within this one weapon art section, and different ways that you can activate them. And you'll realize that it's really important that you know these different weapon arts, just like I'm trying to explain the different types of attacks, and it's actually going to lead us into our next episode, which is going to be all about parrying. And the reason I keep going over these basic attacks and basic functions is because I want to be able to explain exactly which attacks are parryable and which ones aren't. For example, running attacks and rolling attacks 
are very different with ultras from their standard R1s. And the same thing with weapon arts. Certain weapon arts can be parried, and others can't. And some weapon arts can only be parried in certain places, like certain parts of the weapon art, and then others can't be parried at all. So it's just important to mess around, and like I said, this is all leading up to something, and this is leading up to our next video, which I said, and I've revealed now, is going to be all about parrying. And so, with that being said, that brings us to the end of this video, and as I mentioned earlier, this was all very basic stuff that even you absolute beginners out there may have already known, but with this series, I really don't want to leave anything out or skip over anything, and so I hope I'm doing an okay job of that so far. Anyways, that's been it for this video, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.